Hi, welcome to Justin's Morning Coffee. All right, so it is time. It is time for the next, the next part of the seven basic plots. That's right, I finally got around to it. Um, okay, so I'm going to do a quick overview, and then I'm going to go into part two of Overcoming the Monster. Uh, continue our discussion of Overcoming the Monster. Uh, so uh, as a way of review, I'm going through... Uh, Partly Christopher Booker, uh, the seven basic plots, uh, as well as adding in as much insight as I can of my own, my own research into these plot archetypes. So we have Rags to Riches, Overcoming the Monster, Voyage and Return, Quest, Comedy and Tragedy. Uh, oh, let me go to the next slide here. Okay, and... Uh, as I said uh, uh, the last couple of times, I see these plots as um, basically following a life path. Rags to Riches is about uh, going from adolescence to competence, going from pure potential to actually accomplishing something in the world and what that story looks like. Overcoming the monster then is the next part of the journey. And what happens is when you get a little bit of success, when you carve out a little bit of habitable order for yourself in the in midst of the chaotic waters of this world, what happens? You encounter bullies. You encounter malevolence. It's, it's this loss of innocence that happens after you uh, start to move out into the world, out of the shelter and protection of, let's say, your parents or your family. Uh, that little Garden of Eden, that little innocence is lost. And now you're out in the world after your, after your rags to riches story. And, and you're having to understand that not everybody has your best interest in mind. And in fact, not everybody even cares about you. And in fact, there's actual evil in the world. There's actual malevolence in the world. So that's really what the story of the Overcoming the Monster is about. I'm going to go quickly over the rest and then we'll just delve back into Overcoming the Monster. Uh, next is Voyage and Return. Uh, that is really about um, going out and discovering um, what's out there beyond uh, your world and growing into maturity, continuing to grow in maturity and confidence. There is a little monster usually in the Voyage and Return plot, but it's it's a little bit more mature generally than your Rags to Riches plot. Rags to Riches is often more of a children's story. And in Voyage and Return, I would put that as more of a coming of age story, uh, more of a uh, adolescence to adulthood story. Comedy then is sort of the culmination of the first mountain. The first mountain is success. The second mountain is legacy. Comedy is about finding who you are, finding your place in the world, finding your identity. That's why so often there are disguises, multiple identities, mistaken identities, confusion in comedies. And comedy is about going from confusion to clarity. Okay. Now, tragedy is the opposite of comedy, and that is the loss of clarity down into confusion, down this side of the mountain. So the tragedy is usually about someone who has success, but they lose it. They have competence, they have order, but they fall into chaos and death. And then this valley here is the quest valley. I call it the quest valley. And that's where Dante starts out in, um, I know it's it's confusing because it's called the Divine Comedy, but it's actually a quest story. In, in Dante's world, comedy just means happy ending versus tragedy, which means sad ending. Um, and, and Booker and I use comedy in the Shakespearean sense. So that's just a little bit of clarity. Okay, so quest down here. Quest is now going from the midlife crisis. The tragedy leads into the midlife crisis. And then starting on the second mountain. And what is the second mountain? The second mountain is the mountain of legacy. That's where you take all of the things that you've learned, all of the competence, all of the riches, all of the um, knowledge and wisdom about the monster, about strange lands and strange worlds, about uh, riches and treasure. All of that that you learned on this mountain, you are now passing on in some fashion. You're passing it on uh, through um, uh, children and the next generation, education, uh, that sort of thing, mentorship, um, and some way. That's, that's sort of the, the discovery of the value of the second half of life, you could say. That's the quest story. 
uh, in my view. Okay, and then the final one is the Rebirth. Rebirth is like the Christmas Carol, uh, Ebenezer Scrooge, uh, a character that is dead in some way, and then they become reborn. Um, so that's kind of how I plot all, the, all of the plots out. Okay, so now where we left off last time, you can go on my channel, you can look at Overcoming the Monster Part 1. Uh, we were talking about generally Jurassic Park and High Noon. Okay, and so what I want to talk about now is uh, the nature of the different characters. We talked about the landscape of the uh, Overcoming the Monster, and that's where you have um, on the one side the, the safe habitable order and then you have this threat that comes from the outside and then these characters now are going to arrange themselves around the protagonist in terms of how they want to deal with the threat okay and i talked a little bit last time about the foolish versus the mentor the foolish versus the mentor the foolish says maybe the problem will just go away we don't have to confront the problem Right. And I showed you that clip from Jurassic Park, the mayor, or I'm sorry, from Jaws, the mayor from Jaws, who says, listen, you don't want to yell shark on the 4th of July. That's going to ruin all of our business. Um, and generally, that character has a, a, a small view of the monster, basically thinks the monster isn't really that much of a threat. They, they're interested in other things. OK, so in this case, I want to talk about Gary Cooper here in High Noon and Grace Kelly and Helen Ramirez, okay? Uh, one is going to pull in one direction and the other is going to pull in the other direction. One pulls away from the threat and one pulls towards the threat. Now you could think of this, uh, don't necessarily have to think of it in terms of two separate people in this world, but actually as two sub-personalities of Gary Cooper himself, okay? So here's a, a scene which is a conversation between these two figures. Okay, so remember, Grace Kelly says, let's, let's avoid the conflict, let's just get out of town, let's run away. And Helen Ramirez is going to offer a different point of view. So let's watch this scene. You're leaving town. I don't know you. You're afraid, huh? No. Sure you are, you wouldn't be running. You're cutting out with Kane. Oh, it's true. It isn't Kane. But I'm going to tell you something about you and your friend, Kane. It takes more than big bro's shoulders to make a man, Harvey. You want to know why I'm leaving? Then listen. Kane will be a dead man in half an hour, and nobody's going to do anything about it. And when he dies, this town dies too. I can feel it. So I'm going someplace else. That's all. Sit down, Mrs. Kane. No, thank you. What do you want? I've been trying to understand why he wouldn't go with me, and now all I can think of is that it's got to be because of you. He isn't staying for me. I am leaving on the same train you are. Then what is it? Why is he staying? Does the son of guns frighten you that much? No, Mrs. Ramirez. My father and my brother were killed by guns. They were on the right side, but that didn't help them any when the shooting started. That's when I became a Quaker. There's got to be some better way for people to live. Will knows how I feel about it. Okay, so um, notice the symbolism here. If you think of this in terms of two sub-personalities, one side of the personality of Gary Cooper says, I need to confront this, this monster, and one side is the Quaker, the one that says, no, there's no violence, there should be no violence in the world, okay? That's really the lesson, that is really the fundamental question of the Overcoming the Monster story, isn't it? Is there evil out there that is so bad that it requires confrontation, right? Okay, so uh, if you've seen the movie, um, and, and notice the symbolism here too. She's, she's wearing a black dress, she's wearing a white dress. And so there's the sense that the Her Helen Ramirez, who, who is the border figure, remember Quint in Jaws from last time, um, she's the one who has knowledge if you think of it in terms of Star Wars, she's got knowledge of the dark side. Like she's got a little bit of uh, knowledge of the monster. Now, how, why is that? How do, how do we know that? Well, because if you, if you listen to the subtext uh, in the movie, she was with uh, Gary Cooper before Grace Kelly, but she was also with Frank Miller. So she's dated both the protagonist and the antagonist, basically. So she's got knowledge of both. Now, her position is that she wants to get out of town, 
because she thinks Gary Cooper is going to get killed by the monster. And she says, uh, if Gary Cooper dies, then this town dies. Isn't that interesting? If he dies, then the whole town will die. Whereas she's saying, no, we can live. We can live uh, as long as we just keep running away from the monster. Right. Now, why would it be the case that if Gary Cooper dies, if the sheriff, remember, this is what he represents as the law and order. He's the sheriff. If the sheriff dies, the whole town will die. Why is that? Um, I think what it is, is it's referring to a principle, which is that if you make a deal with the devil, let's say, it's, it's going to come back. Um, it's not going to just disappear. Um, I talked a little bit uh, about that last time with the credit card bill, right? If you ignore your credit card bill and you ignore your credit card bill and you ignore your credit card bill and you never deal with it, it's just going to grow and grow and grow and get bigger and bigger. Um, another principle of this is uh, found in Halloween, the way that we celebrate Halloween, right? Um, in Halloween, um, someone, a, a monster comes to your door, right? A monster comes to your door, knocks on the door and says, what? Trick or treat, okay? And what is that? That's, a, that's, an, that's asking, um, I need something from you. Otherwise, I'm going to use violence against you. That's basically what it is, right? And that's the logic of the, of the criminal or the demon or the devil, you know, the dark side, right? The logic is, um, give me what I want or I'm going to threaten you, right? So that's the whole idea of the, in the Western, right? The, the uh, town is being exploited. The peaceful townspeople are being exploited by some bandit or some robber. It's like, you got to pay off the robber so that you can keep doing your stuff, right? And so this is ritualized in our, our Halloween celebration. And the idea is that you, you pay the demon once, you pay the monster once, you give it a treat, and it goes away for a year. But then it comes back. But what happens when it comes back? It's grown stronger. Because why? Because everyone's been feeding it. They've been feeding it little morsels so that they don't have to deal with it. And, and so um, one thing that the foolish, let me find it. Uh, one thing that the foolish don't understand is that you can't keep feeding the monster. If you keep feeding the monster, it's going to come back and eventually get you. This is, this is Lloyd Bridges here. Um, and so there's a sense of, again, somebody knows that the monster is real and the monster needs to be confronted. And somebody thinks we can just placate the monster. Either we can run away from it or we can just give it a little, a little something. It's like, give him, give the monster this one town. Let Frank Miller take over this one town. But is that going to stop there? You know, if you let, uh, if you let lawlessness in the door and you let it take over one town, is it going to be satisfied with just that one town? That's the question. Okay, so let's watch a scene now. I think what's interesting to watch is how these different archetypes play out in different movies. So right now I want to talk about the foolish. What's the logic of the foolish here? And then we'll talk about the border figure, the logic of the border figure. And just as a quick sketch, the border figure has some kind of knowledge of the threat. They've experienced the evil in the world. Quint here has seen what a shark can do. Uh, Helen Ramirez has seen what Frank Miller can do. And so it gives them a certain bit of wisdom that is not over here in the innocent. Why? Because they're naive. Because uh, they don't have a sufficiently, in the logic of this story anyway, a sufficiently complex uh, view of the real threats that are out there in the world. And then the foolish here, these are people who have smaller goals you know, he wants to keep the economics of the town in place. He wants to become sheriff himself. He, so they have these kind of selfish goals. And they think because the, the threat isn't really something to be taken serious, this crisis moment is a time right now to, to, to take advantage of whatever it is that they want. Okay, so I'm going to show you two examples of that. First one is in High Noon. 
You know what's doing? Sure. Oh, come on. Uh, this ain't really your job, you know. Well, that's what everybody keeps telling me. Yeah, when I tell you it means something, so you can just listen a second. If you'd gone with a new marshal not due here tomorrow, I'd be in charge around here, right? How come the city fathers didn't trust me with a permit? Maybe they didn't ask me. Maybe they figured you were too young. <laughs> it's very simple, Will. All you gotta do is tell the old boys when they come that I'm the new marshal. Well, I can't do it. Why not? The truth is you probably talked against me from the start. I haven't got time, Harv. Okay. Then let's get down to business. You want me to stick, you put the word in for me like I said. It's gotta be up to you. Okay, <laughs> sure I want you to stick, but I'm not buying it. Okay, so what's going on in that scene? Uh, so Lloyd Bridges, let's go back here. Lloyd Bridges here. He's got his own his own plans, his own agenda. He does not take the threat of Frank Miller, and I I love I love how the threat of Frank Miller is always represented by these empty train tracks. You know, it's he's coming, he's coming, uh, the monster is coming. Okay, so um, there's a lot of talk in that scene about um, how Lloyd Bridges is young. Gary Cooper saying you're young, uh, you have a lot to learn, and he's expecting that he's gonna he's gonna make his own desires subservient to the higher need at the moment, which is this threat, right? But in a way, you could say, in an Aristotelian sense, that his desires are disordered. He's, he's out of proportion with, with reality, right? In reality, who's sheriff? Um, him putting in a word for him, uh, Gary Cooper putting in a word for Lloyd Bridges um, to become the next sheriff, you know, all of these other instrumental goals that he has are nothing compared to the threat of this outlaw coming in and taking over the town, right? Like I said, this, you let that, that lawlessness in, and it's going to destroy him. So it's a very symbolic gesture here. He finally says, what? You're not going to do what I want. You're not going to uh, uh, put in a good word for me. You're not going to let me be the next sheriff after you leave town. Um, and so I'm taking off the star, right? So now, what's the difference between him and the outlaw? Right? He's just taken off the star. There's a sense that he doesn't want law. He wants what he wants. <laughs> right? He wants him to bend the rules for him. And so now what's happening? He's becoming more like the monster. He's moving in the direction of the monster. And that's what happens. The, the, the saboteur fool. That's what I call it. There's always, not always, but oftentimes in these stories, there's a fool. He's naive. He doesn't take the, the, the threat seriously. And he's, uh, he, he becomes a saboteur. So you could think of it this way, all right? Think of it as, as kind of like a chess match. Here you've got the monster and the threat, okay? The hero here is moving to confront the monster. The border figure here has knowledge of both, but this is something important about the border figure, which I talked about last time. The border figure doesn't have a, a higher loyalty when it comes to right and wrong. The border figure just wants what's best for them. Think of uh, of Quint in Jaws, right? He's like, listen, I'll go out and kill the shark for you, but you got to pay me. You got to pay me what, what I want to get paid. If you don't pay me, I'm not going to help you, right? Um, and then Helen Ramirez, she, she tells uh, Lloyd Bridges in one of the scenes in High Noon, I'm leaving town because I know that the town is going to die when Frank Miller kills Gary Cooper, right? Um, she doesn't care about the town. She doesn't care about higher law and order, but she knows how to save her own skin. She knows how to, she's, she works in the world in a very practical and instrumental way. Okay. But as you notice, there's two different kinds of foolish people. There's the foolish saboteur. That's someone who sees an opportunity and takes it while not taking the monster seriously. And then there's the naive foolish. This is the, the mayor at the very, very beginning, which I showed last time, uh, the scene where he says, listen, if you just leave town, I, I have a hunch that Frank Miller's not going to do anything and nobody's going to die and everything's going to be fine. Now, Helen Ramirez and Gary Cooper know that that's wrong. Once they let Frank Miller in and there's no law and order, what's going to happen? There's going to be a power vacuum and he's going to take over and he's going to become the mob boss. He's going to rule the town. That's why Helen Ramirez wants to leave. Okay. Um, 
All right, so I'm, I'm going to explore a little bit the difference between the naive foolish and the foolish saboteur here. Uh, the, the naive foolish in Jaws is the mayor. If you yell shark on the 4th of July, we're going to lose all of our, of our money, right? Um, what about in Jurassic Park? Okay, I, I love how these things just start to kind of all line up, these patterns. All right, now the monster... It's again the same thing. You've got your protagonist here. You've got your innocent. Often the innocent is represented by a child. Um, you've got your border figure, the, the hunter. And then you've got your two kinds of foolish over here. You've got Dennis and you've got John Hammond. You know, um, He doesn't take it seriously because he thinks we can control what? Nature. The threat. We can control this. Um, and uh, But Dennis... He's the one who takes advantage. He, he doesn't take it seriously, but he also wants to get something in a kind of nefarious way. Okay, so let's watch that scene. This is the, the naive foolish in Jurassic Park. You shouldn't use my name. Dodson! We've got Dodson here! Nice hat. What are you trying to look like? A secret agent? On delivery, 50,000 more for each viable embryo. That's well, how am I supposed to transport them? The bottom screws is open. <laughs> Compartmentalized inside. <laughs> you got so that's great. Oh. There's enough coolant inside for 36 hours. No, ma'am. 18 minutes and your company catches up on 10 years of research. Gracias, senor. Don't get cheap on me, Dodson. <laughs> Don't get cheap on me, Dodson. <laughs> um, so you can see the value here. Right, this is a lower order value. Right, he is willing to become a saboteur. He's willing to allow this technology to to go into the hands of whoever uh, in exchange for money. All right, so that's that's who Dennis is. He does not take the threat seriously. So now let's fast forward a little bit and see what happens to the uh, the saboteur. This is a thing in the ring. Tied to the. <laughs> My glasses. I can afford more glasses. Well, gotta go. Oh, thought you were one of your big brothers. You're not so bad. Anyway, you want food? Look at me. I just fell down a hill. I'm soaking wet. I don't have any food. Stick, stupid. Not just stick, boy. And no wonder you're extinct. I'm gonna run you over when I come back down. Okay. <laughs> so things don't turn out so well for old Dennis, don't do they? Um so the question is, is there a connection between this combination of naivete and selfishness and the inevitable demise of these characters? Um, I mean, I, I, I think what the plot, what, the, what this archetype is trying to say is that there's something in the world that you need to respect. Um, you need to respect this higher level of right and wrong. And if you think that you can get away with something, you can't. <laughs> and, and the weird thing is, and, and we talked a little bit about this before, there's this Jonah effect. Jonah is swallowed by the whale, and the whale, which represents Leviathan, Timot, all these kind of ancient ancient gods in the in the old world of that represent chaos that come out of the water is swallowed by the whale doing the bidding of Yahweh so Jonah tries to run away from reality run away from from Yahweh and the monster is what brings him back very very weird idea so in in this case this is this is clearly an immoral character a selfish character, a character that's ruled by his passions. You know, he needs to eat. He needs money. The one thing that he says to this monster, to this dinosaur, is what do you want, food? 
right? He only understands the lower order wants and desires, you might say. And the 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 nature, <laughs> the animals, you know, the lizard part of reality will then eat you if you are ruled by only your lower lower order passions, you might say. Um, so very interesting. So let's take a look at another example. The delusional architecture is fairly unique. She believes that a machine called a Terminator, which looks human, of course, was sent back through time to kill her. And here we are. Morning, Sarah. Good morning, Dr. Silverman. Repeated escape attempts. Let's move on, shall we? So this is uh, Terminator 2. And uh, we're going to get a, a nice look at uh, the fool in, in this case. And they fly apart like leaves. Dreams, <laughs> cataclysm, the end of the world are very common. I know the date it happens. I'm sure it feels very real to you. Okay, so here we have in Terminator 2, Sarah Connor. Uh, Sarah Connor wants to... Uh, understands the threat right because she's been through it all in, in the first movie uh, and she's the she's the one like gary cooper in in uh, high noon or like um uh the uh, the two scientists in jurassic park or etc cetera, etc cetera, uh, that say you need to take this threat seriously and then here we have just like the mayor in jurassic in um, jaws or the mayor in high noon uh, someone who is uh, very rational very you know and uh, but that doesn't believe it doesn't believe uh in this in this threat um and of course what's going to happen they're always going to be proven wrong um okay so let's take a look at another one here i wish there were i want your full attention starling yes sir be very careful with hannibal lecter all right, this is uh, a scene from Silence of the Lambs. We're going to look a little bit more at Silence of the Lambs uh, uh, going forward here because it, it, there's some very, very interesting, interesting distinctives about this particular one. Silence of the Lambs is about uh, Jodie Foster, who is a young um, uh, psychologist, researcher, uh, detective, and uh, wanting to solve a murder. So it's a, it's a, it's a classic uh, solve a murder story. And uh, I want you to take a look here at the fool, the fool character. Believe me, you don't want Hannibal Lecter inside your head. Just do your job, but never forget what he is. Oh, he's a monster, a pure psychopath. So rare to capture one alive. From a research point of view, Lecter is our most prized asset. You know, we get a lot of detectives here, but I must say I can't ever remember one as attractive. Will you be in Baltimore overnight? Because this can be quite a fun town if you have the right guide. My instructions are to talk to Dr. Lecter and report back this afternoon. I see. Oh my, does he hate us, thinks I'm his nemesis. I don't believe Lecter's even seen a woman in eight years. And oh, are you ever his taste, so to speak. All right, so this is Dr. Chilton. So notice some similarities here, right? He's got lower order um, desires, right? He's not taking the monster seriously. Now, we'll talk a little bit more on whether or not Hannibal Lecter actually is the monster in this, in this story. But um, so Dr. Chilton, what does he do here in this scene? He makes a pass at Jodie Foster, right? He basically hits on her, okay? Now, that's a little mini version of what the murderer is doing. The murderer is victimizing women for his own purposes, and he doesn't see them uh, for, for who they are. He sees them only for their skin. Um, if you've watched uh, the movie, he's making a suit out of the skin of women. It's a, um, the serial killer in this. So he sees the value only as skin deep in some sense. And so here we have Dr. Chilton and he sees this researcher come into his office and immediately what does he think? Just wants to get laid, right? That's what he wants. He doesn't have the, 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 the full view of a human being in front of him, right? Um, and so again, there's this kind of connection between 
the saboteur fool and the monster. There's this moral connection, you might say. You know, they're, they're within the world of order. They're within the world of habitable order. Dennis it works in the in the Jurassic Park factory. Um, uh, Lloyd Bridges is um, part of the uh, of the town on the on the sheriff's task force. Um, he's uh, Doctor Chilton is uh, part of the research team studying the uh, phenomenon of secure, serial killers, trying to bring them to justice. But he's got something twisted about his morals. You know, he sees the monster as a curiosity. Oh, he's a monster. It's so interesting that we captured one alive. You know, it's as if you can control it. Very similar to John Hammond in Jurassic Park. You know, no, no, no. We can control this monster. It's not going to get out, right? That's kind of the same with Dennis in Jurassic Park, right? I can give out this technology to someone else. It's not going to come back and affect me. Well, what... What happens to Dr. Chilton at the end of Silence of the Lambs? Those of you who've seen the movie, you know what happens to him. And it's <laughs> it's definitely get him, in some sense, getting uh, the consequences of his actions. Okay, so let's take uh, one more look at the saboteur, the naive foolish. Uh, this is um, a scene from uh, the original Alien, the Ridley Scott 1979 Alien. Uh, with Sigourney Weaver and Ian Holm here. And uh, those of you that have watched the movie, you will know Ian Holm is the saboteur in this. He is the naive foolish. So this scene takes place just after they went exploring uh, through the ship and some weird alien attached itself to the face of somebody. And now uh, the doctor, uh, Ian Holm on ship, is now studying this, this specimen. And this is a conversation between Ripley. And again, Ripley is the one, just like Gary Cooper, just like the two scientists in a couple in Jurassic Park, um, just like Jodie Foster in uh, um, Silence of the Lambs, the protagonist is saying, we need to take this threat seriously. And then here's, here's what happens. A little talk. How's, uh, how's Kane? He's holding, that changes. I have confirmed that he's got an outer layer of protein polysaccharides. Well, it's an interesting combination of elements, making him a tough little son of a bitch. And you let him in? I was obeying a direct order, remember? You also forgot the science division's basic quarantine law. No, that I didn't forget. Oh, I see. You just broke it. Huh? Look, what would you have done with Kane? Hmm? You know his only chance of survival was to get him in here. Unfortunately, by uh, breaking quarantine, you risk everybody's life. Maybe I should have left him outside. It's a pretty big risk for a science officer. I do take my responsibilities as seriously as you, you know. You do your job. And let me do mine, yes? Okay, so... The great Ian Holm, you do your job, let me do mine. Um, interesting. So Ridley is saying, we're not supposed to break the quarantine rules. We're not supposed to, remember, the monster, you, you, you've, you've carved out a safe place for yourself. Amityville Island, the little western town, in this case, uh, the ship that they have that's sailing through space. And outside, you don't know what's out there. That's the monster represents the unknown. And so the idea of quarantine is, is something that's going to come up in these Overcoming the Monster plots because it's the interjection of an alien element. element. You know, so the, 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 the interjection of something that could carry disease, something that uh, has its own agenda and, it, and wants what it wants and it doesn't care about you. You know, all of these threats that come from the outside. And the idea is we need to take those threats seriously. Now, Ian Holm here, what was it that he was drinking right there? It looked like he was drinking milk. Well, what we're going to find out is that He's actually, that's actually the, the robot fluid, the android fluid that he's drinking. That's a little clue uh, to find out what, what he has later. But what's the distinctive thing about him here? Um, he seems to be 
operating according to his own rules. And again, that's the same thing with Dennis, right? His own rules. Same thing with Lloyd Bridges' character in High Noon. His own rules. And failing to respect the higher laws, you might say. Not respecting the star, the, the badge of Gary Cooper. Not respecting the senior officer, in this case, of, of Alien. Uh, in Dennis's case, not respecting the uh, his his bosses at the at the company, not being content with what he's being paid. Um, so there's always some kind of instrumental goal that they're looking for, but they don't understand that once the monster comes in and obliterates everything, your money doesn't make any difference, right? Dennis's money doesn't make any difference if the if the dinosaurs kill him. Um, being sheriff of a town that is controlled by an outlaw and being under the thumb of that outlaw won't make any difference because this is an evil that's going to destroy everything. That's, I think, the kind of the 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 message of of this plot type. All right, so now let's let's fast forward and take a look at what happens to uh, to our lovely uh, doctor, uh, Ian Holm. Open the door. Okay, so turns out Ash is a robot, and he's got all this kind of weird milky fluid uh, <laughs> that, that is the lifeblood of these androids. Um, so in that scene, uh, in, in this scene, Ripley finds out, let's go here, priority one. Ensure return of organism for analysis. All other considerations secondary. Crew expendable. Okay, so in that scene, what does Ripley find out? Ripley finds out what that lower order instrumental goal was for the saboteur, right? The same thing as Dennis. He wanted to get money for the embryos. Uh, Lloyd Bridges wanted to become sheriff once Gary Cooper leaves town. And now Ian Holm, Ash, in this case, he's going according to this directive. Science officer eyes only. Priority one, ensure return of organism for analysis. That's the alien. All other considerations secondary, crew expendable. Now, it's the same thing. Remember that Helen Ramirez said, if Frank Miller comes into the town, this town dies. So if Frank Miller comes in and kills the representative of law and order, which is Gary Cooper, then the town will die. That's the principle here. Okay, um, If the dinosaurs get off of the island, then they will eat all the humans. That's the principle in Jurassic Park. Okay, Now, in this case, if they bring this alien back to Earth, what's going to happen? It's got acid for blood. It's a complete predator. It's going to do the same thing. It's going to eat everybody. So there's this connection between... The quarantine, you know, the, the we need to keep this threat outside of our little habitable order that we built. The idea that there are threats and evils out there that are beyond our understanding and they need to be taken seriously. That's what this directive represents. Um, somebody's going to come along and not take the threat seriously and say, let's, uh, let's, let's get some money. Let's uh, uh, let's use this for our advantage, not realizing uh, that nothing will matter once that monster is is on the ship, or once that monster is on Earth, or once that monster is let loose, um, there will be nothing left. It's it's you know kind of like the idea of uh, you know somebody uh, when there's about to be a nuclear war, they're trying to get a raise in their job. It's a, it's a lower level thing, you know, and then. 
a, a huge, huge threat. Okay, so that's uh, several different examples of of how the the foolish, the naive foolish, and the foolish saboteur uh, sort of play themselves out in the context of this plot type. So next, what I want to do is I want to take a look at the monster itself. Okay, now Booker uh, says that the monster has basically three functions: um, the predator. That is the, the initial kind of confrontation with the monster is that it's a predator. It wants to eat. It doesn't care who you are. And it basically wants what it wants. And it's more powerful than you are. So it's a predator. Okay. Then the next um, sort of function of it is what he calls hold fast. That is the idea of the dragon in the cave guarding the treasure. Or uh, in this case, King Kong. Um, on top of the Empire State Building with uh, uh, the woman. Um, there's this idea that the monster is holding something of value and keeping it hostage. So there's this predator aspect, and then there's the holdfast aspect, and then there's the Avenger. Uh, the Avenger aspect is when you go in there and you take that thing of value, it's going to now come after you. And, or you go in there and you try to kill it, you poke it in the eye, um, like in in Jaws, you know they're shooting it with uh, with harpoons and and barrels and whatnot. It's not running away; it's coming to eat your boat. <laughs> and so, um, uh, yeah, think of it in this way: Booker uses uh, um, Jack and the Beanstalk. You know, the, in the first uh, iteration of Jack and the Beanstalk, is he he climbs up the beanstalk and he sees this giant. And the giant is basically eating everything in sight. Fee fi fo fum. I smell the blood of an Englishman. You know, um, and he's but he's got the goose that lays the golden egg, right? So he's got the value there, and so he's guarding this. So when Jack takes the goose that lays the golden eggs and runs away, now the monster comes after him, and it becomes an avenger. So that's what we're going to look at next. A couple of examples of of how that plays out in these movies. I can go slow ahead. Come on down and chump some of this shit. You're going to need a bigger boat. Okay, so you're going to need a bigger boat. <laughs> um, so, uh, so remember our, our five acts uh, that we talked about last time. Um, so the monster is a predator. You've got blood in the water. Uh, it's it's king of its domain, uh, and and you're basically going out there and you're you're poking it in the eye. This is Jack, you know, climbing up the beanstalk and seeing the giant. Okay, so remember, so our anticipation stage, that's basically the beginning. That's when you start to learn that this little world of peace and tranquility is being threatened by something outside, something unknown. Then you get into the dream stage, and that's the, the stage of initial success. So they go out, they kill a shark, but it's not the real shark. It's just a shark. Uh, they go out, they confront Grindel, they pull off Grindel's arm, but they're unaware that Grindel's mother is lurking out there. So, the, so you, you, you make an initial step uh, towards the threat, and because nobody's expecting you, um, because maybe the monster isn't used to being challenged, you know, all these different reasons, you'll have some quick success. And then you get to the frustration stage. Now, the frustration stage is like what I like to call the curveball effect. You know, you have a little bit of talent, you go out there, you're able to hit the fastball, and then what happens? Your antagonist <laughs> decides to throw you now a curveball. Okay, so that's the frustration stage. So that's when it's like, okay, uh, We've got, we need a bigger boat <laughs> because this is a bigger problem than we thought it was. Okay, so that's moving now from the dream stage into the frustration stage. And that is where, let me go back to this, that is where the monster switches from a predator to a hold fast. Um, and then if you keep poking him, <laughs> he'll turn into an aven avenger. Basically, right now in the story of Jaws here, we've moved into the frustration stage and the more we keep poking that monster we're going to move now into the into the nightmare stage okay so keep that in mind as we as we go forward so 
Uh, again, the dream stage is over and the frustration stage is the initial confrontation with the actual monster, not the fake monster, not the monster's son, not the other, the littler shark, but the actual monster. And then, of course, the nightmare stage is when uh, the monster, you face the full force of the monster's wrath. That's when the monster gives you its full attention, and that's when it switches from uh, hold fast to Avenger. Now it's, it's coming for you specifically. Power in the line of the Fowlers. Hello. Hello. Hello, Mayday Orca. Coast Guard. That's great! That's just great! Now where the hell are we, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not viable, but I'll tell you this! Boys. Oh, boys. I think he's come back for his noon feeding. <laughs> You're certifiable, Quint. Um, oh, boys, he's come back for his noon feeding. Uh, this is now the Avenger shark. This is not uh, just a, a mere predator. Uh, this is now a shark that wants revenge, right? Um, and, and this is the other thing that sort of characterizes the nightmare stage is madness, <laughs> you know? So think of it just in terms of your normal dreams, you know, like a, a, a dream stage has the feel of you know, kind of a, a magical world or a world that's not completely in reality, you know, all of that uh, uh, symbolism and, and uh, meaning that, that is evoked by the word dream, you know. But when you get into, you know, frustration, that's pretty obvious. Like, okay, you're dealing with reality now. It's not a dream. It's not your fantasy world. You know, you think like when you initially go out to uh, confront a problem, you're pretty much projecting your what you think is a solution, what you think how the world is onto the problem. And then when you actually get into it, you realize it's not so easy because the world is a lot more complex than you initially thought. So that's that, low, you're, you start with a low resolution overlay projected onto the world. You think this is gonna be easy. You go out, that's your dream stage, and then you encounter it and it's not so easy and it's way more complex and your low resolution becomes more high resolution. You could think of it that way. Your your projection becomes now replaced with a much more higher resolution uh, view of the world. Uh, and then, but when you get into the nightmare stage, that's also going back into the dreamland, and it and it's and it's it's not fantasy on the positive sense. In like, I have this fantasy idea that I can go out there and do what I think I can do, and reality may have something different to say. But it's fantasy on the madness side. You know, so there's, this is a famous clip. Why does Quint destroy the radio? That's a, and we talked a, a little bit about that in part one, where maybe there's some guilt that uh, Quint has for delivering the bomb to Hiroshima. Maybe, maybe, maybe. But there's a bunch of different theories out there. Um, but one thing's for sure, and that's that we've now entered the realm of madness. And you're going to see this in these stories over and over and over. By the time you finally get to that final confrontation with the monster just before the climax. That's the stage where you're gonna to start to see bending of reality, fantasies, but all on the negative side. So then we get our, our Avenger, the, the quintessential uh, Avenger um, transition from the nightmare stage into the final climax. And, and notice, Again, this is going to be the wrapping up of Quint's storyline, Quint, the border figure. And uh, there's different ways that this border figure will, will end up. Sometimes the border figure turns out okay. Sometimes, as in this case, the border figure dies. Um, uh, but it's usually in that final, it's like the, the monster finally has its way. Um, and uh, the only thing left is now the hero. That's the only person that can finally uh, 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 kill this Avenger. Um, so here's, here's, here's the nightmare stage just before it transitions into the final climax. Okay, so... <laughs> uh, Quint has finally 
met his demise. And there's a sense that um, this may be some kind of justice in his mind, you know, uh, that he's, he's got this obsession, this madness uh, in that nightmare stage to confront um, to confront the shark. Now, of course, um, this movie has been uh, heavily influenced by Moby Dick. I don't think you can ever have uh, a fish story uh, in the in the overcoming the monster genre without um, being influenced by Moby Dick. And one thing that Moby Dick did is it is it inverted the archetype. Uh, it's a monster overcomes you instead of overcoming the monster story. And so it's very interesting that Jaws here. Uh, in the in the end of the '70s, that was a time when people were when things were snapping back into the archetypal form. Uh, you you might say Star Wars, Jaws, Indiana Jones, you know uh, Spielberg and Lucas uh, um, and Robert Zemeckis and those that cohort from USC uh, film school and whatnot. Um, they were kind of discovering, and this is what happens: is is stories will kind of deviate from the archetype and then. They snap back at a certain point because those archetypes, those grooves, uh, you, you, that's a theological term, the grooves of creation. There's a sense that they kind of, you just, you kind of, like when you're driving on the road and there's some ruts in the road and you just kind of end up in those ruts, you know. Um, and so it's very interesting that uh, Moby Dick, and this is a very long discussion. If you ever wanted to discuss Moby Dick versus Jaws, that could be a whole course, you know. <laughs> but the short uh, version of it is that, um, that in Moby Dick, um, Captain Ahab had this obsession to kill the monster, but rather than the monster getting killed by Captain Ahab, K Captain Ahab was killed by the monster. Um, and so it's, it's this upside down version of this archetypal story, monster overcomes you. Now you'll see this all the time where you have inverted versions of the stories. Um, but here Spielberg inverts it back, but he makes the Captain Ahab character, the ode to Captain Ahab, you might say, is the border figure uh, and not the uh, the primary antagonist or the primary protagonist, you know. And th that's one of the things that's very interesting about these plots is you have these archetypal um, sort of like pillars, you might say. You've got your antagonist, the monster, you've got your protagonist, the knight um, with the lance. <laughs> this is just like this is just like uh, St. George and the Dragon, you know. Um, and then you've got your border figure, your innocent, you know, all these archetypal um, uh, figures. Now, you could take a movie and you could say, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a light sketch of overcoming the monster, but I'm going to make it primarily about the border figure, or I'm going to make it primarily about the innocent, or I'm going to make it primarily about the fool saboteur. Right? You could pick one of these and kind of increase the weight of that of that particular archetypal character. Um, and so let's just wrap this up, wrap up our story of Jaws. So now we finally get to the thrilling escape. Uh, and this is where basically now the hero has nobody left but himself. Whatever it is that he learned from the mentor, which is Richard Dreyfuss in this case, and from the border figure, which is Quint in this case, and he's going to take the higher wisdom and the lower wisdom, you might say. The wisdom from the, the, the head knowledge of the mentor, which is, um, which is uh, Richard Dreyfuss, and the gut knowledge <laughs> of the border figure, which is Quint, and he's going to combine the two uh, in order to finally kill the monster. So let's take a look at that. Come on, show me the tank. Smile, you son of a... <laughs> okay, so that is known as the obligatory scene in the Overcoming the Monster movie. This is the final confrontation between the protagonist and the monster. And if it is one of these archetypal stories, uh, then the protagonist is going to kill the monster. The protagonist is going to behead uh, the dragon. Um, now you might just think, well, that's that's not the part of the plot that you have to really think a lot about. You don't have to think super hard about how the monster dies. All you have to do is make sure that it is the hero that kills the monster. Okay. Um, but Maybe not. Maybe it's a little bit more complicated than that, um, or at least more significant than that. 
Um, I want to suggest that there is a learning process that goes on. And I really, really think that that's what these, these plot types, these stories are trying to do. They're trying to teach us something about the world. Um, so if you think of the two, um, the two mentors, you might say, the two uh, um, people that are advising Sheriff Brody, on how to confront the monster here. And this is this is very typical, I think, of these kind of stories, is that you have one mentor who represents more head knowledge, uh, represents, you might say, the combined, the collective wisdom of the community. Uh, Richard Dreyfus is educated. Uh, he's a shark expert. He um, uh, has all of this technology, right? And then uh, Quint has all of the street knowledge. He's the one who actually goes out and somehow operates, lives, is able to survive within the realm of the dragon, within the layer of the dragon, you might say, uh, out in the ocean uh, where the sharks are. And so Sheriff Brody, along the way, he is basically taking some of the higher knowledge and some of the more, you, you okay, how about this way? The head knowledge versus the gut knowledge, you might see. Now in the, in the, in the Bible, there's, uh, there's the spleen or the gut, you know, that's the, that is the passions. That's, that's what uh, uh, Quint here uh, represents. And then you've got the head and then what's in the middle, the heart. The heart is the combination of head and spleen. It's kind of funny. Uh, usually that's not translated as spleen. But in the ancient world, the spleen or the gut um, was the passions. And then the, the mind was, was the head, the knowledge. And so, uh, and then the bringing of the two together, that's the heart. And the heart, the marrying of the two, that's the one that finally is able to overcome the monster. So I want to show a scene from earlier on in Jaws where you really see this juxtaposition between the higher knowledge and the more base knowledge, high culture versus low culture. And it's this conflict basically between Richard Dreyfus and Quint. And Sheriff Brody now, he's got the task of how to take, stop these two from fighting, first of all, and harmonize them, unify them, so that, that knowledge can be used to finally kill the monster. So let's take a look at this scene and see if you if you don't uh, pick up what I'm throwing down, so to speak. Hey, Chief. Here's to swimming with bow-legged women. Mr. Hooper, I'm not talking about pleasure boating or day sailing. I'm talking about working for a living. I'm talking about sharking. <laughs> Just tie me a sheep shank. You didn't say how short you wanted it. Give me your hands. That looks like a kitty scissor class has cut it up for a paper doll. Been counting money all your life. All right, all right, all right. Hey, I don't need this. I don't need this working class hero crap. You got it. Number 14. Straight, yeah. Get in, Lance. What are you, some kind of half ass astronaut? <laughs> Take that gun down of yourself, below, and you'll secure. You're Okay, so <laughs> we've got conflict between Quint and Richard Dreyfus. Um, so see how it's set up here. Richard Dreyfus has got head knowledge, he's got education, but he's got soft hands. And Quint, he's got hard hands, and he, uh, you know, boils the the. Uh, uh, teeth of the of the shark, the jaws of the shark, and he's intimate with the harsh realities out there. Okay, and and, and what he says, what are you, some kind of an astronaut? <laughs> he's got this, and we know what's going to happen with this. This this is not going to hold up against the shark, but he has right here. What is this? This is the instrument that will finally blow up the head of the shark. So there's a sense that um, Sheriff Brody, the heart the protagonist needs both head and spleen, for lack of a better term, head and gut. Um, he needs the courage. He needs the, you know, sort of ability to face the monster from this border figure. And as we talked about in the, in the part one, um, he's part monster himself in some sense. Uh, that border figure is always kind of a little far away from 
organized society, a little bit uncouth, a little bit, you know, and that's because he knows about evil, really. Um, you might say that he's got what? Knowledge of good and evil, or maybe knowledge of evil, knowledge of good. I don't know if you could put it that way, uh, but something like that, right? So it's a very different relationship, these two mentors here. They're actually helping the protagonist go out and confront, whereas these down, the, the innocent and the foolish, they're sort of safe and secure inside the world that doesn't have that kind of evil. And so the, the, the adventure really is him having to venture out and actually confront the evil. And along the way, he needs to gain this knowledge. So you could say that the way, the manner in which he kills the shark, which is using one piece of him, which is the courage to face him and shoot him with a gun, and one piece from him, which is the technology that he brought along, his astronaut <laughs> technology that he made fun of, right? He made fun of his astronaut uh, um, paraphernalia, but that became one of the ingredients of killing the shark. He made fun of Quint's uh, working, has, uh, working class hero BS, right? <laughs> but as you saw, uh, Sheriff Brody really needed to have both, okay? So... Um, that's kind of how the whole thing uh, culminates. The whole overcoming the monster finally culminates in this in this confrontation, and it all um, is building up to that point with knowledge that that hero has gained from that. Okay, so I think we're going to stop for now. We've made it all the way from the beginning the anticipation stage where we learned that something out there was lurking, the dream stage where they had initial success that was fake in some way, that wasn't a real confrontation with the real monster. It was a fantasy. It was a projection um, on the positive side. Then we had the frustration stage where you actually realize that your, your projection starts to fade away and you're confronted with actual reality. Things aren't going to be as easy as you thought. And then the nightmare stage where that monster turns from just for a predator and a hold fast, wanting to keep his own stuff, wanting to eat what he wants to eat, etc. Predator hold fast to Avenger. Why? Because you poked it in the eye. You stabbed it with with a harpoon and it and it's got a barrel that's holding it up now. Um, or you went into the lair of the dragon and you woke it up. You know, there's all of these different ways that this dragon now turns. Uh, this monster turns into an Avenger and it's coming right after you. Jack and the Beanstalk after you stole the Golden Goose. Right. And that leads to the nightmare stage where it's a world of madness. It's the counterpoint to the dream stage in the sense that this is a positive uh, hallucination, you might say, and this is a negative hallucination. The reality, you might say, is neither this good nor this bad, but we need to kind of see both. And then finally, that equilibrium is finally reached when we have the thrilling escape the final confrontation, everything that that protagonist learned along the way is now used to finally cut off the head of the dragon. And now there can be peace in the community once again. And that protagonist uh, has learned uh, something about reality. And we have learned something about reality. So thanks for watching. I know it was a long time in coming in getting part two of Overcoming the Monster. Uh, and next, uh, we will move on to... Voyage and Return. So Voyage and Return is going to be the next plot type. And thank you for watching.